people, welcome. Welcome, my people, to our very first video lesson of 2016. This is going to be a little awkward. It's even more awkward for me because I'm teaching a lesson to a classroom that is absolutely empty. Okay? So hopefully you're at a place where you are able to watch the entire video uh, and then you're in a spot where you can take some notes. So here's how the video is going to work. Okay, I'm going to go through the lesson that, that I, you, I would have given you in class. And you're going to have your notebook out just like you would in class and you're going to be taking notes with what I do up here. There's going to be moments in the lesson where I actually ask you to pause uh, the, the video or however you're watching it, hit pause, and I'm going to ask you to do a few things. And then I'll tell you to uh, turn you know, back with me in the video and I'll continue working. So if you just watch the video without pausing, you probably aren't going to have enough time to get everything done that I'm going to ask you to do. So whenever you need to, pause it. You can always go back and rewatch something if it didn't make sense. Or if I go too fast, you can always go back and rewatch that. But I need to make sure that you're ready to go. So in front of you right now, before you even start this, you should have your notebook. You should have something to write with and probably a graphing calculator to help you with a few of the calculations we're going to do. Okay? Well, if you've got those things, we're going to jump right in and get started. Okay? So the title of our lesson, first of all, it's section 5.7 from our textbook. And the title that I would like for you to write at the very top of your notebook page is finding and using roots and zeros. Finding and using roots and zeros. Okay? So if you need to pause now and get yourself set up, get yourself situated, get your notes ready to go, go ahead and do that. Okay. Hopefully you've got your notes all set up and you're ready to go. So we're going to jump right into this. So we're, we're going to do two example problems together. Okay? Two example problems together. And then uh, we'll be done with the video and you'll be prepared for what I have for you to do in class while I'm going. Okay, so first of all, here we go. Example number one. Here's what example one is going to say. Example one is going to ask you to find the zeros of f of x, comma. Okay, and then skip down to the next line, and we're going to write out what f of x is. Here's how f of x is going to be defined for us. f of x is going to be defined as 27 x to the 6th plus 54 x to the 5th minus 4 32 x to the 4th minus 856 x cubed plus 16 x squared minus uh, 128 x minus 256 okay so that's our function that's been defined. Now here's the point where I want to emphasize why we used a comma here as opposed to a period. If you used a period here, that would be a very valid question that in fact you are going to be expected to do on your exam. But the problem is we haven't gotten to that section yet. If I put a period here, that would be a problem that you'd encounter from 5.8. And we just haven't gotten to 5.8 yet. So the reason that there's a comma here is because we're still only in 5.7, I still have to give you another piece of information. So here's the next piece of information. It says find the zeros of f of x, comma, and I just explained why that comma is important. If x plus 2 is a factor. If x plus 2 is a factor. Now that piece of information is critically important. That's vitally important to this problem. I could have told you that elephants are gray, uh, but that doesn't do us any good. That's a true statement, but it doesn't help us in this context. So what makes the fact that x plus 2 is a factor so important? Well, to answer that question, you have to go back to 5.6 and think about what you know about uh, the factor theorem. Okay, We wrote that down in our last class. The fact that x plus 2 is a factor, that tells me something very special. When I take f of x, this entire function here, and I divide it by x plus 2, you know what your remainder is going to be. When you do that division, what remainder will you get? So it's okay to answer out loud. Seriously, you can do it. Okay, hopefully you had the courage to say x plus 2. If not, you need to get over your fear of talking to a video because we're going to ask, I'm going to ask you a few other questions as we go, and you need, to, you need to be with me. Okay, trust me, it's more awkward for me in an empty classroom than it is for you probably at your house. So hopefully you said zero, because we know that if we divide this function by a factor, our remainder should be zero. So that's the one piece of information we know. We also know that if we divide this big, long, seven-term polynomial by 
x plus 2, that polynomial is going to be condensed. It's going to get smaller. The smaller that it gets, the easier it is for us to potentially work with. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to divide this function f of x by x plus 2 using synthetic division. Now, if you are still a long division holdout, you are still insistent on using long division, hey, that's totally fine. Okay? But the, the, the catch that I would tell you is long division takes a little bit longer than synthetic division. But if you want to keep doing it, by all means, that's totally fine. So now would be a good time to pause the video and do this division either using synthetic division or long division. Okay, hopefully you actually paused the video and did this. I'm going to go ahead real quickly and go through the synthetic division. Okay, so I'm setting it up with uh, my negative 2 and then all my lead coefficients, 27, 54, negative 4, 32, negative 8, 56, positive 16, negative 128, negative 256. So I'm going to go through. This synthetic division actually it looks a lot more challenging than it needs to be, or it, it, than it actually ends up being. The numbers worked out really nicely. So I bring the 27 down, 27 times negative 2, negative 54. 54 plus negative 54 is 0. 0 times negative 2 is 0. Negative 432 plus 0 is negative 432. Negative 432 times negative 2 is positive 664. Uh, I'm sorry, 864. Positive 864, my mistake. So negative 856 plus 864 uh, should give us negative, uh, positive 8. 8 times negative 2 is negative 16. 16 plus negative 16 is 0. 0 times negative 2 is 0. One, negative 128 plus 0 is negative 128. And then negative 128 times negative 2 is positive 256. And negative 256 plus positive 256 gives me a remainder of 0, which is what we would have expected. Now look what's happened here. We've essentially taken f of x. And we haven't changed the essence of f of x. We've just changed its composition what it, or what it looks like, okay, its appearance. We haven't changed the essence. We've just changed its appearance, okay? So here's where we're at. We've taken that function and we've brought it down to x plus 2. We brought the x plus 2 out. And we have 27x to the fifth minus 432x cubed plus 8x squared minus 128. So we took a seven-term polynomial, and simply by dividing by that factor that I gave you, we brought it down to a four-term polynomial. Now, four-term polynomials are pretty nice to deal with. In fact, the last class that we had, I had you write a note that every time you have four or more, uh, you should try grouping first. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to try to factor this a one step further using grouping. Okay? The hint is that grouping will actually work here. So pause the video now and factor this uh, one step further by grouping. Okay, hopefully you're back and you actually did what I asked you to do and factored. If not, uh, you're um, not doing what I asked you to do and that's not how uh, you're gonna make this video work the best for you. Okay, so here we go. When we do this by grouping, the first two terms have a 27x cubed in common. So I'm gonna pull out a 27x to the third. When I do that, I have x squared left over minus 16. So in order for grouping to work, the second binomial here should be x squared minus 16. And that actually works out nicely because if I factor out an 8, I have an x squared minus 16 left over. So then the next step is to take this x squared minus 16 and pull it out. So don't forget about the original x plus 2 that we had. So now we have the uh, x squared minus 16, we pulled that out, and we have 27x to the third plus 8 left over. Left over. So 27x to the third plus 8 left over. So we are slowly but surely taking steps in the right direction. We've got three terms now. Now I would hope that everybody that's watching this video right now has a siren that's going off in their brain when they see x squared minus 16. It's literally blaring louder than that fire alarm was today in school. So we're going to take this term, x squared minus 16, and we're going to apply the difference of squares here. So we can factor that one step further. So we have x plus 2 times x plus 4 times x minus 4. Hopefully, we all have a siren that's going off when we see something like 27x cubed plus 8 
That is the sum of two cubes. It's the sum of two cubes. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take a second, you might need to pause here if you haven't done so already, and try to factor the sum of two cubes. Look back on your notes from last class if you need a reminder on that. But this is the sum of two cubes. Try to factor that out now. Okay, hopefully you factored, factored that on your own. Uh, here we go. So this is what it would be when we factor it. It's going to be 3x plus 2 times 9x squared minus, because that sign is always opposite of this one, 3x times 2 is 6x plus 2 squared is 4. So what you have here is you've taken f of x and you have factored it completely. This trinomial 9x squared minus 6x plus 4 cannot be factored. Okay, it cannot be factored. So what we have to do next is we have to take this expression, okay, and we have to uh, actually do what the problem asked us to do and find the zeros. The problem didn't ask us to factor completely, it just asked us to find the zeros, okay? So I'm going to erase what I have here and do that work accordingly. I'm going to leave that last line so I can know what our factored form was, okay? So to find the zeros, what I'm going to do is I'm essentially taking this equation and I'm setting it equal to zero. To do that, you take each individual binomial and this last trinomial and set it individually equal to zero. So I'm simply going through those binomials. The first one, x plus 2 equals zero. That x value would be negative 2. The next is x plus 4 equals zero. Subtract 4 on both sides and I get x equals negative 4. The third one is x minus 4 equals 0. Add 4 on both sides, we get x equals 4. The fourth uh, term here is 3x plus 2 equals 0. Subtract 2, divide by 3, and I get x equals negative 2 thirds. Now, this trinomial is going to be a little tricky. These other ones were actually pretty easy. You could have done those mentally. The trinomial is going to actually require us to use quadratic formula. So I have 9x squared minus 6x plus 4 equals 0. So I would definitely use the quadratic formula to solve this. So here's the next part. I want you to pause here, and I want you to try quadratic formula. If you can't remember quadratic formula, you've got a ton of options to look it up and figure it out. But I want you to try to solve for x here using the quadratic formula. Okay, hopefully uh, you've got your x values here. Let me go through it really quickly and see if we got the same thing. So I get x equals negative b, which is uh, negative negative 6, so positive 6, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 36, minus 4, times 9, times 4, which I get a discriminant of negative 108, all over 2 times 9, which is 18. Now, if you stopped here, you haven't necessarily done anything wrong, but you haven't simplified this, uh, these two solutions as completely as possible. So what I can do is the square root of negative 108, ask yourself right now, and even if you need to pause, now is a fine time to do that. Ask yourself, how can I simplify the square root of negative 108? What can you pull out of the square root of negative 108? You can definitely pull out an I, if some of you just said, I can sense it. Okay, I know you, 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 you just said negative 1. So you can pull out the negative and it comes out as an i. Then you've got to think about 108. How can I break down 108 uh, into uh, the product of a perfect square? Uh, and if you uh, are like me, you probably need to do some guess and check on that. And uh, through whatever process you use, hopefully you get to the point that 108 is 36 times 3. So we can think of this. We know we can bring the negative out by taking the i out of the radical. But if we think of this as 36 times 3, the 36 comes out of the radical as what? A 36? No, not as a 36. How does it come out of the radical? It's okay to say it out loud. Nobody will judge you. You're right. It's a 6. It comes out as a 6. So here's how I can simplify this. x equals 6 plus or minus. Uh, the 36 comes out as a 6. I, the 3 is still left over in the radical. All over 18. All over 18. Now, again, if you get to here, you haven't done anything wrong yet, but it's not completely right. We need to factor it one step further. Notice how the 6, this 6, and the 18 are all divisible by 6. 
So what we can do is we can divide everything by 6 so that our final answer is x equals 1 plus or minus i root 3 all over 3. So you have effectively found all six zeros of the original function that we wrote down. It was a sixth degree polynomial, so we need to do account for six zeros. We have one, two, three, four, and this term here counts for two, two zeros, so that brings us to a total of six. Now the next thing you'll have to do in 5.7 is they'll actually ask you to describe those zeros as either real or complex. Complex and imaginary, same thing. So in this particular case, how many real number solutions do we have? If you said four, you're right. We've got one, two, three, four real number solutions. I know they're real numbers because I look at them and they don't have an I in anywhere. So four real solutions and two imaginary solutions. Okay? So that's the first half of 5.7. Now let's move on to example two. If you don't have enough time to finish the whole video right now, now would be a great time to pause and you can jump back in and uh, pick up example two uh, whenever you have time to finish it. Okay, so here we go. Example two. Here's the second type of question that's going to be uh, in this assignment for 5-7. You'll be asked to write a polynomial function. So write a polynomial function. with integer coefficients that has the following zeros. It has the following zeros. And if you've noticed, yes, I do have music playing in the background because it's incredibly awkward to talk in a dead silent room. So I needed something to keep my sanity. So here we go. Here's what the directions are going to say. Write a polynomial function with integer coefficients that has the following zeros. zeros. What this means, integer coefficients, is that just means when you're done, you're going to have an equation that's only integers as your coefficients, no fractions, no decimals. Okay. Basically what we're doing here is I'm going to give you zeros, and you're going to do what we did in example one, just in reverse. In example one, we factored it down, found the zeros, and then we were done. In example two, I'm going to give you the zeros, you're going to write out the factors, and then you're going to multiply to get your original function. Okay? So here we go. Here are the zeros for this particular function. Negative two, three i, and one minus the square root of three. One minus the square root of three. There's a couple twists and turns that you're going to re read about in 5.7 if you need to that I'll go over with you now. Let's take the root of negative 2. Okay, Let's take the root of negative 2. If this is one of the solutions, that's essentially saying that x equals negative 2. Well, if I take this a step backwards, what would I have had right before I had x equals negative 2? We would have had x plus 2 equals 0. So the first factor of the polynomial function that we're trying to write is x plus 2. Now, these, these second two roots are actually a little deceptive. There's something in your uh, section on the book on 5.7 called the complex conjugate theorem. The complex conjugate theorem. And what the complex conjugate theorem states is that anytime you have a complex root or any root that has an I in it, you're going to have both the positive and the negative. Notice when I wrote this out, I did not include negative 3i, but the complex conjugate theorem tells you that if 3i is a root, negative 3i needs to also be a root. So what that basically is saying is we should think about this root as x equals plus or minus 3i. Now if we work backwards from here, what should come to your mind when you see an i? You're right, the square root of negative 1. The square root of negative 1. So we could rewrite this as x equals plus or minus 3 times the square root of negative 1. Well, then what we can do is we can take this 3 and we can slide the 3 back into the radical. 
Does it go in as a 3? No, it goes in as a 9. So what we have here is we have x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 9. Well, if you remember back to the quadratic unit, chapter 4, when we did something very similar to this, the next thing we would do to get rid of the radical and the plus and minus is we would square both sides. So what we have here is we have x squared equals negative 9. We're so close to being done. The last step is to add 9 to both sides. We get x squared plus 9 equals 0. So this is our second factor. Again, our first factor was x plus 2, and we just found our second factor, x squared plus 9. Now the third factor we have to figure out is 1 minus uh, root 3. There's another theorem that helps us uh, figure out what we're doing with 1 minus root 3. It's called the irrational root theorem. The irrational root theorem. This is very similar to the complex conjugate theorem, but what it says, if you have 1 minus the square root of 3, 1 plus the square root of 3 must also be a solution. Just because I didn't write it here doesn't mean that it's not one of the roots. Okay, so here's what we can do with that. Think of this as x equals 1 plus or minus the square root of 3. Again, just because I didn't write out 1 plus the square root of 3, we now know the irrational root theorem, and that's not in your book, by the way. That's bonus. Okay, that's just because I think that you're better than the book. We can, we can think about this as 1 plus or minus root 3. It's actually going to be two different roots. Okay? So similarly to what we did here, I want you to take a second and try to work backwards to find the factor that would give you this set of solutions. Okay, hopefully you actually did that because I'm going to move really quickly through this. We subtract the 1 on both sides and we get x minus 1 equals plus or minus the square root of 3. Then we square both sides. We have x minus 1 squared equals 3. Foil the left-hand side, we get x squared minus 2x plus 1 equals 3. And then I subtract 3 on both sides, so I get x squared minus 2x minus 2 equals 0. There's my third factor. There's my third factor. Okay? So I've got my three factors here, and I'm going to erase the rest of this to get, get myself a little bit more room. Okay, so here's what we've got. We've got our function as x plus 2 times x squared plus 9 times x squared minus 2x minus 2. That bell means it's B lunch. So while you're enjoying your lunch, I'm working hard to make sure that you don't fall behind. Okay, here we go. So here are our three factors. Now, It'd be really great if you could write this polynomial function in factored form because this would be done. But what we actually have to do is we have to multiply this out. So I would definitely FOIL these first two and then take my product and multiply it by this trinomial. That's all mathematics that you know how to do. So pause it right now and multiply this and then check back with me when you're done and we'll see if you got the same answer that I did. Okay, I know some of you aren't pausing the video. Do it now. All of you. Still, pause it. All right, hopefully you're back with me. I feel like such a fool doing this, but this is how much I care about you. I'm willing to be a fool for you. Here we go. So when we multiply this, uh, I'm gonna do the binomial first, so I get x to the, uh, to the third plus 9x plus 2x squared plus 18, okay? I scan this. Unfortunately, there are no like terms for me to combine there, so I'm gonna leave it just like this. So now I'm going to multiply it by the trinomial, x squared minus 2x minus 2. And let's go and let's see what we get. So x cubed times x squared is x to the fifth minus 2x to the fourth minus 2x cubed plus 9x to the third uh, minus 18x squared minus 18x. Uh, then I have... Uh, plus 2x to the 4th minus 4x cubed uh, minus 4x squared. Okay, I have three more terms to get. Plus 18x squared minus 36x 
minus 36. Holy cow, a lot of terms here. Let's see if we can go through and clean some of these up. All right, so I know I have an x to the fifth. I'm gonna underline my terms when I use them. It helps me figure out when I've used them and when I haven't. So now I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna add up my to the fourth power. So I have negative two x to the fourth power plus two x to the fourth power. So those actually are gonna cancel each other out. So I have zero x to the fourth. That's nice. Let's move on to the cubed terms. Negative two plus nine is seven, positive seven, minus four is positive three. So plus three x to the third. And I really hope you're checking this at home, wherever you're watching this, because I don't know if I made a mistake. If I did, we're just gonna roll with it, and you, hopefully you're smarter than I am, but we're just going with it, okay? So uh, you've probably actually already figured out if I made a mistake or not, so this feels a little awkward for me. Okay, the x squared terms. We've got a negative 18x squared here, Minus uh, 4 is negative 22, plus 18 uh, turns out to minus 4x squared. So I get rid of those. Get rid of those. And then my x terms, I've got uh, negative 18x minus 36x. So negative 18 minus 36 more gives me minus 54x. And then I have one constant minus 36. So here is my polynomial function that would give me the zeros that I was given at the beginning. That, ladies and gentlemen, is awesome, and that is all I've got for you. So you, at this point, are totally prepared for the in-class assignment that you're going to have with Miss Moriarty, okay? Uh, she'll explain the directions to you, and I uh, hope you have a really great day, and please don't hesitate to send me your mind messages with any questions that you have. Or you can also send me remind messages to tell me how awesome you thought this video was. So thank you so much for being uh, attentive. I hope this wasn't uncomfortable for you. Remember, if you thought it was weird, imagine doing this in front of an empty classroom. But uh, you all have a great day, and uh, I will see you all when I get back next week. Bye-bye.